and all work goes to the masses. Why would anyone just settle for a life of farming day in and day out? There are two reasons for this phenomenon. The first reason was due to necessity. It took many more people to feed an empire and a family back then. And the second reason being philosophy. Towards the end of the Zhou dynasty, the beginning of Eastern philosophy was created. Confucius created a philosophy system justly named Confucianism, which is focused on the importance of respect, loyalty, and responsibility in all relationships in life. A central concept of Confucianism is called Li, which can be translated as rituals, customs, or manners. Li refers to the formal and informal social conventions that guide societal behavior. It is seen as maintaining order and harmony in social relationships, while Lao Tzu created another philosophy called Taoism. The word Tao means the way or the path, and Taoism teaches that individuals should seek to align themselves with the natural flow of the universe, rather than fighting against it. Live your life as peacefully with yourself as possible, and don't worry about external things outside your control, just focus on your farming. One of the most famous contemporaries from Taoism is the idea of yin and yang, representing complementary and interdependent forces in nature, such as light and dark, hot and cold, or masculine and feminine. Taoism teaches that by balancing these opposing forces, individuals can achieve harmony and fulfillment. Confucianism and Taoism made life bearable for ancient Chinese farmers. But as time progressed, the city-states that occupied ancient Greece grew. Around 800 BCE, the Greek city started to realize that the land they occupied was practically infertile, so to produce an essential staple of grain, they had to import it. Hence why the Greek states had to colonize the world around them. The city-state Miletus, at its height, had over 90 colonies throughout Europe, producing food for the Greeks. At its height, the Greek had set up colonies from modern-day Marseille in France to Rostov-on-Don in Russia. One of these new emerging city-states was Rome. As legend has it, Romulus and Remus were twin brothers abandoned by their parents and placed into the river Tibet. As the basket floated across the river, a female wolf discovered the two orphans and nursed them back to health. When Romulus and Remus became adults, they decided to find a city where the wolf rescued them. However, this created turmoil as both brothers wanted the site to be named after themselves. As Romulus and Remus fought relentlessly, eventually Romulus came up with the final blow and killed Remus, creating Rome in 753 BC, and became the supreme ruler of Mesopotamia and even the Indus Valley civilization. The world was in Cyrus's hand. Cyrus then took over the Greek colony of Ionia in Asia Minor, leading a great Persian Empire, and then he died, leaving it all in the air for the next great Persian king, Darius the Great. While back in Greece, various city-states started to gain power, but two were at the forefront, Sparta and Athens. Sparta was a military powerhouse. The famous Spartans believed everything should focus on physical strength and war. When a new young Spartan was born, it would be slaughtered if it didn't look healthy. Boys were taken from their families at a young age and were trained to become soldiers. The brutal training included physical conditioning, weapons training, and harsh living conditions. The entire life of a Spartan was to win a war. Their society reflects it with three main groups. The ruling class consisted of aristocrats who held political power, the free non-citizens who were not allowed to participate in government but were still expected to serve in the military, and the helots, a group of enslaved people that provided labor for the Spartan state. Life in Sparta was harsh, brutal, and militaristic. While their neighbors up north were experimenting with this idea of democracy, Athenian democracy was a highly complicated mess. There were two branches, the Council of 500 and the Assembly. 
The Council of 500 was selected randomly by a process known as sortition. Athens itself was made up of 10 different tribes. Each tribe was responsible for providing 50 citizens to serve for one year in the Council of 500 via random selection. Each eligible citizen would be given a personalized token. Those tokens were inserted into a particular machine called a claritarian. This long-lost technology included tubes and balls, which somehow selected 50 residents of each tribe to join the illustrious Council of 500. While in the assembly, there was a system in place that said that every single citizen had a vote. Of course, to be a citizen, you had to be a male and not a slave, and either born in Athens or to Athenian parents. The Council of 500 would create the agenda for the main assembly to vote on because over 30,000 people could have a vote at any given time. It was total chaos. So to quell this, the council would nominate nine presidents the morning of the meeting, and it was their job to ensure all the rules and procedures were being followed. Since they were appointed right before the assembly met, they were almost impossible to bribe. Somehow, the assembly would loudly vote on whether a bill would pass. They would vote on matters like appointing generals, various laws, and other government bureaucracy. However, not everyone liked this Athenian democracy. The famous Greek philosopher Plato thought the idea was barbaric. In Book 6 of his seminal book, The Republic, Plato writes, The true navigator must study the seasons of the year. The sky, the stars, the winds, and all the other subjects appropriate to his profession if he is really fit to control the ship. Think that it's quite impossible to acquire the professional skill needed for such control, and that there's no such thing as the art of navigation. How much could a randomly selected member of the Council of 500 really know? How much could he fully contribute to society? Should we allow a random member of society to have any power? Instead, Plato would advocate for the idea of a philosopher king, a man who studies wisdom, logic, and reasoning, a man who dedicates his life to understanding how to be just, a man who will become the navigator of wisdom. Plato would rather say, the society we have described can never grow into a reality or see the light of day, and there will be no end to the troubles of the states or indeed, my dear Glaucon, of humanity itself, till philosophers become rulers in this world, or till those we now call kings and rulers really and truly become philosophers, and political power and philosophy thus come into 